Okay, so we're starting here um, in chapter two. I am pulling up the link to the text. Other things um, that's going on is we're, we're starting chapter two. Um, remember that our main character is called Equality25271. Um, his friend is International48818. I'm not gonna call people by this whole long name. Um, the author did this intentionally because it is so impersonal. Um, I just can't say all these numbers. It's, it, it's going to take forever. So I'm going to, from this point on, refer to our characters as equality and in international. And we will get our new character, our love interest, um, today. So we spent a lot of time getting our setting and our character. Um, now we're going to start really building some of those conflicts and add that new character in. Okay. So let's go to part two. Um, part two is a little long. It, well, it's, it's the second longest chapter. But as I've said, once we're done with it, um, it is going to, we're going to be like over halfway done with the book. So part two starts with this. And the question I'm asking you is, do you believe in love at first sight? Liberty five, um, 3000, Liberty five, 3000, Liberty five, 3000. We wish to write this name. We wish to speak it, but we dare not speak it above a whisper. For men are forbidden to take notice of women and women are forbidden to take notice of men. But we think of one among women, they whose name is Liberty, <laughs> five, three thousand. And we think of no others. The women who have been assigned to work the soil in the homes of the peasants beyond the city. Um, where the city ends, there is a great road winding off to the north, and we, street sweepers, must keep this road clean to the first mile post. There is a hedge along the road, and beyond the hedge lie the fields. The fields are black and plowed, and they lie like a great fan before us, with their furrows gathered in some hand beyond the sky, spreading forth from that hand, opening wide apart as they come towards us, like black pleats that sparkle with thin green spangles. Women work in the fields and their white tunics in the wind are like the wings of seagulls be, um, beating over the black soil. Okay. So he's got himself a little crush. We find out that women are the farmers in this society and that the farmers have to wear white tunics. Who designed this? Obviously, someone who's never worked on a farm before. Sorry. And there it was that we saw Liberty walking among the furrows. Their body was straight and thin as a blade of iron. Their eyes were dark and hard and glowing with no fear in them, no kindness and no guilt. Their hair was golden in the sun. Their hair flew in the wind, sh um, shining and wild as if it defied men to restrain it. They threw seeds from their hands as if they deigned to fling a scornful gift and the earth was a beggar under their feet. Okay. So, uh, Liberty is thin. She's got blonde, crazy wild hair that blows in the wind. And uh, he's like, she's hot. We stood still. For the first time, we, um, uh, for the first time did we know fear and then pain and then we stood still that we might not spill this pain more precious than pleasure so they saw each other and it's like oh, I'm like scared but I'm also like sad and there's pain in my heart he, he's got that first little tinklings of love then we heard a voice from the others call their name, Liberty 53000, and they turned and walked back. Thus we learned their name, and we stood watching them go till their white tunic was lost in the blue mist. Okay. So this society, men and women, aren't allowed to be like, hey, what's up? You're cute. Um, they can't holler at each other. So what does he do? He just, like, stares from the field at her, kind of creeper-like. But he's doing the best he can without any sort of like societal structure for engaging with women. Okay. 
And the following day, as we came to the Northern Road, we kept our eyes on Liberty in the field. And each day thereafter, we knew, um, and each day thereafter, we knew the illness of waiting for our hour on the Northern Road. <laughs> and there we looked at Liberty each day. We did not know whether they looked at us also, but we think they did. <laughs> um, then one day they came close to the hedge and suddenly turned to us. They turned in a whirl and in the movement of their body stopped um, as if slashed off. Then suddenly it had started. They stood still um, as a stone and they looked straight upon us, straight into our eyes. There was no smile in their face and no welcome. But their face was taut and their eyes were dark and they turned as swiftly as they walked away from us. Okay, so they kind of stared. They had a, a little bit of a moment. But the following day, when we came back to the road, they smiled. They smiled to us and for us. And we smiled in answer. Their head fell back and their arms fell as if their arms and their thin white neck were stricken suddenly by a great lassitude. They were not looking upon us, but upon the sky. Then they glanced at us over their shoulders as we... Um, as we felt as if a hand had touched our body, slipping softly from our lips to our feet. They smiled at each other. Every morning thereafter, we greeted each other um, with our eyes. We dared not speak. It is a transgression to speak to men of other trades, save in groups at the social meetings. But once, standing at the hedge, we raised our hand to our forehead and then moved it slowly, palm down towards liberty. Um, maybe like a little hay, give him a little hay, um, uh, had the other seen it, they could have guessed nothing for it looked only as if we were shading our eyes from the sun, but Liberty saw it and understood. They raised their hand to their forehead and moved it as well. Oh, they did a little salute back to each other. Thus, each day we greet Liberty, um, and they answer, and no man can suspect. We do not wonder at this new sin of ours. It is our second transgression of preference, for we do not think of all our brothers as we must, but only of one, and their name is Liberty. We do not know why we think of them. We do not know why. When we think of them, we feel all of a sudden that the earth is good and that there is not a burden to live. We do not think of them as Liberty any longer. Um, we have given them a name in our thoughts. Whoa. Um, maybe sometimes you do this. You're like, ooh, blue shirt over there. He kind of did that. We call them the golden one. But it is a sin to give men names which distinguish them from other men. Yet we call them the golden one for they are not like others. The golden one are not like the others. Okay. So, liberty is the golden one, okay? Keep that link together. And we take no heed of the law, which says that men may not think of women, save at the time of mating. Yeah, we're going to go there, people. This is the time each spring when all the men older than 20 and all the women older than 18 are sent for one night in the city palace of mating. And each of the men have one of the women assigned to them by the Council of Eugenics. Children are born each winter, but women never see their children and children never know their parents. Twice have we been sent to the Palace of Mating. It is an ugly and shameful matter of which we do not like to think. Okay. So this is how the children get born, is they assign a guy to a girl and then they go... So notice how they say the palace of mating. I wonder if this is like the palace of corrections. They just like change the name for, for this purpose. So they, they like send them to a hotel or something and then they let them do their business and babies are born. Okay. That is the society. We have broken so many laws, and today we have broken one more. Today we spoke to the golden one. The other women are far off in the field, and we stopped at the hedge by the side of the road. The golden one were kneeling alone at the moat, which runs through the field, and the drops of water falling from their hands as they raised the water to their lips. 
They were like sparks of fire in the sun. Then the golden ones saw us and they did not move, kneeling there, looking at us. And circles of light played upon their white tunic from the sun on the water of the moat. And one sparkling drop fell from a finger of their hand, held frozen in the air. Okay. He's definitely smitten, right? The word I like to use in the spring is um, Twitter painted. He's like, oh, I just like her. I like her so much. Okay. The golden one rose and walked to the hedges if they heard a command in our eyes. The two other street sweepers of our brigade were a hundred paces down the road, and we thought that International 4818 would not betray us, and Union would not understand. So we looked straight upon the golden one, and we saw the shadows of their lashes, of their white cheeks, and the sparks, and the sun on their lips, and we said, you are beautiful, Liberty. Their face did not move, and they did not advert their eyes. Their Only their eyes grew whiter, and there was triumph in their eyes, and it was not triumph over us, but over things we could not guess. They asked me, what is your name? Equality, we answered. You are not one of our brothers, Equality, for we do not wish you to be. Okay, we cannot say what they meant, for there are no words for their meaning, but we know it without words, and we knew it then. No, nor are you one of our sisters. If you see us among scores of women, will you look upon us? We shall look upon you, Liberty, if we see you among all the women of the earth. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, they talk for the first time, and they're like, hey, what's your name? And then they have to do this little double check where they're like, you're not like other people. Like, I don't think you're like the other people. And he's like, I don't think you're like other people either. Like, you're different. You're special. So they have a little bonding moment. And then she says, are the street sweepers sent to different parts of the city or do they always work in the same places? They always work in the same places, we answered, and no one will take this road away from us. So that means like, don't you worry, babe, I'm going to be back here tomorrow. Um, Your eyes, they said, are not like the eyes of any among men. And suddenly without cause for the thought which came to us, we felt cold, cold in our stomach. How old are you? We asked. They understood our thought for they lowered their eyes for the first time. 17, they whispered, and we sighed as if a burden had been taken from us. For we had not been thinking without reason of the palace of mating. And we thought that we would not let the golden one be sent to the palace. How to prevent it, how to bar the will of the councils, we knew not. But we knew suddenly that we would. Only we do not know why such a thought came to us, for these ugly matters bear no relation to us and the golden one. What relation can they bear? Okay. Let's break down this. So he's like, how old are you? Because what he wants to know is, like, are you of mating age? Like, are you going to be sent to go do it with strangers? Um, because in his thoughts, when he thinks about her, he's like, I can't let this happen. I love her so much even though he doesn't know what that word is, he's like, I have these feelings that I would not let another man touch her. And they don't understand what like these butterflies are they're feeling. They don't know. They don't even understand how this act of mating has a connection with what they're feeling for each other because this whole society has been broken down to not encourage that. So they're doing the best they can to make a love match when this society has done everything it can to discourage all affection, like all of this specialized affection. So like, there's no boyfriends, girlfriends. No, you you get to go mate in the, in the palace of mating once a year if you're picked. That's, that's what we got, folks. Um, still without reason, as we stood there by the hedge, we felt our lips drawn tight with hatred, a sudden hatred for all our brother men. Um, and the golden one saw it and smiled slowly. And there was a smile, the first sadness we had seen in them. We think that in the wisdom of the golden one had understood more than we can understand. Mm. Maybe she does understand like relationships more than he does. 
Then three of the sisters of the field appeared coming towards the road, so the golden one walked away from us. They, t um, they took the bag of seed and they threw the seeds on the furrows of the earth as they walked away. But the seeds flew wildly, for the hand of the golden one was trembling. Yet, as we walked back to the home of the street sweepers, we felt that we wanted to sing without reason. We were um, so we were reprimanded tonight in the dining hall. For without knowing it, we begun to sing aloud some tune we had never heard. But it is not proper to sing without reason, save at the social meetings. We are singers because we are happy, we answered. The one of the home council who reprimanded us. Indeed, you are happy, they answered. How else can men be when they live for their brothers? And now, sitting here in our tunnel, we wonder about these words. It is forbidden not to be happy. For it has been explained to us that men are free and the earth belongs to them and that all the things on the earth belong to all men and the will of all men together is good for all. And so all men must be happy. Yet as we stand here tonight in the great hall, removing our garments for sleep, we look upon our brothers and we wonder. The heads of our brothers are bowed, the eyes of our brothers are dull, and never do they look one another in the eyes. The shoulders of our brothers are hunched, and their muscles are drawn as if their bodies are shrinking and wish to shrink out of sight. And a word steals to our mind as we look upon our brothers, and that word is fear. There is a fear hanging in the air of the sleeping halls and in the air of the streets. Fear walks through the city. Fear without name, without shape. All men feel it, but dare, but none dare to speak. We feel it also when we are in the home of the street sweepers, but here in our tunnel, we feel it no longer. The air is pure underground. There is no odor of men, and these three hours give us strength for our hours above ground. Okay, um, just so you know, you can be typing questions at any time. Um, I'm looking at the clock right now, and I'm double-checking where we're at. We are almost done with two. So he's talking about this fear and about how the only place without the fear is in his tunnel. And so he's contrasting like feelings between the happiness that he feels when he's with Liberty and, and he feels so happy that he starts singing, but he's not allowed to sing um, because that's weird. Like, but what he's seeing and what he's starting to realize is that as he looks around the people, everybody tells him he's supposed to be happy, but he's not. And like everybody says, if the earth is ours and we all work together for the greater good, then we should be happy. He's like, but we're not. And so what's happening in this chapter is Ayn Rand is taking um, this beautiful little baby relationship between equality and liberty. And then they're saying, you know how much we value um, a love match in Western culture? like. That doesn't exist here. And so this is where the influence of her being, um, of her growing up in a communist Russia, it starts, she starts sprinkling that in a little bit more and saying how everybody is carrying this fear and this burden, but nobody wants to, to speak about it. Um, so we... We're pretty close to being done, so hang tight. Our body is betraying us, for the council of the home looks with suspicion upon us. It is not good to feel too much joy, nor to be glad that our body lives. Why not? For we matter not, and it must not matter to us whether we live or die. What? Which is to be as our brothers, will it? But we, equality, are glad to be living. And if this is a vice, then we wish no virtue. 
So this is another section where um, this is another section when um, they're bringing that idea that because it's the will of your brothers and because it's all about society as a whole, it actually doesn't matter whether you live or die as long as you are contributing to society. And if you are contributing to society, then you should be happy and shut up. And that's kind of how they're showing is that that's not actually the case. Like you can contribute to society, but you also need your individualism. Okay. Yet our brothers are not like us. All is not well with our brothers. There is fraternity, a quiet boy with wise kind eyes um, who cry suddenly without reason in the midst of day or night and their body shakes with sobs they cannot explain. Um, there are solidarity who are a bright youth without fear in the day, but they scream in their sleep and they scream, help us, help us into the night in a voice which chills our bones, but the doctors cannot cure solidarity. And as we all undress at night in the dim light of the candles, our brothers are silent for they dare not speak the thoughts of their minds for all must agree with all and they cannot know if their thoughts are the thoughts of all. So they fear to speak. And okay, this is kind of true like in a classroom too, when people are like, I have so many questions, but I'm not gonna ask. And they are glad when the candles are blown for the night, but we equality look through the window upon the sky and there is a peace in the sky and cleanliness and dignity. And beyond the city, there lies the plain and beyond the plain, black upon the sky, there lies the uncharted forest. We do not wish to look upon the uncharted forest. We do not wish to think of it, but ever do our eyes return to that black patch upon the sky. Men never enter the uncharted forest for there is no power to explore it and no path to lead us among its ancient trees, which st stands as guards of fearful secrets. It is whispered that once or twice in a hundred years among the men of the city escape alone and return to the uncharted forest without call or reason. These men do not return. They perish from hunger and from the claws of wild beasts which roam the forest. But our council say that this is only a legend. We have heard it that there are many uncharted forests over the land among the cities, and it is whispered that they have grown over the ruins of many cities of the unmentionable times. The trees have swallowed up the ruins and the bones under the ruins and all the things which perish. And as we look upon the uncharted forest far in the night, we think of the secrets of the unmentionable times and we wonder how it came to pass that these secrets were lost to the world. We have heard the legends of the great fighting in which many men fought on one side and only a few on the other. These few were the evil ones and they were conquered. Then great fires raged over the land. And in these fires, the evil ones and all the things made by the evil ones were burned and the fire which is called the dawn of the great rebirth was the script fire where all the scripts of the evil ones were burned and with them all the words of the evil ones great mountains of flame stood in the squares of the cities for three months then came the great rebirth okay so we get a little backstory there was a war and then the people who won was like we're gonna burn all the books so that nobody has any idea of what the before time was like so that's what the like the council of elders decided to do whoever the council was at that time the words of the evil ones the words of the unmentionable times what are the words which we have lost may the council have mercy upon us we had no wish to write such a question um and we knew not what we were doing until we had written it we shall not ask this question and we shall not think it we shall not call death <coughs> upon our heads <coughs> And yet, and yet, there is in um, some word, one single word, which is in the language of men, but which have been, and it is the unspeakable word. I'm going to ask you this question later, which no man may speak or hear, but sometimes it is rare. Sometimes someone among men find that word. They find it upon scraps of old manuscripts or cut into fragments of ancient stones. But when they speak it, they are put to death. 
There is no crime punished by death in this world save this one crime of speaking the unspeakable word. We have seen one such of men burned alive in the city square, and it was a sight which has stayed with us through the years, and it haunts us, and it follows us, and it gives us no rest. We were a child, yet 10 years old, and we stood in the great square with the, all the children and all the men of the city set to behold the burning. They brought the transgressor out into the square and they led them into the pyre. They had torn out the tongue of the transgressor so they could speak no longer. Ooh, the transgressor were young and tall. They had hair of gold and eyes of blue as morning. They walked to the pyre and their step did not falter. And all the faces of that square, of all the faces which shrieked and screamed and spat curses upon them, theirs was the calmest and happiest face. As the chains wound over their body at the stake and the flame set to the pyre, the transgressor looked upon the city. There was a thin thread of blood running from the corner of their mouth but their lips were smiling and a monstrous thought came to us then, which has never left us. We heard of saints. There were saints of labor and the saints of the councils and the saints of the great worry birth, but we had never seen a saint before, nor what the likeness of a saint should be. And we thought then standing in the square that the likeness of a saint was the face we saw before us in the flames, the face of the transgressor, of the unspeakable word. And as the flames rose, a thing happened which no eye saw but ours, else we would not be living today. Perhaps it had only seemed to us, but it seemed to us that the eyes of the transgressor had chosen us from the crowd and we were looking straight upon us. There was no pain in their eyes and no knowledge of the agony of their body. There was only joy in them and pride, a pride holier than it is fit for human pride to be. And it seemed as if these eyes were trying to tell us something through the flames to send into our eyes some word without sound. And it seemed as if these eyes were begging us to gather that word and to not let it go from us and from the earth. But the flames rose and we could not guess the word. What? Even if we have to burn for it like the saint of the pyre is that unspeakable word. Woo! So good. Okay, you guys are champions. You are, you really, really are. So I'm gonna end the text here. Um, what I want to do is I wanna give you a chance though. I don't know if you've ever used a Jamboard before, um, but as you read, you should be having lots of questions. It should be like, when you grow, like it should be hard and you should have questions. So um, it, as you have questions, you can type them out. If you click on this button, like you can use a little sticky note. Um, I'm going to put this link in the chat right now. And um, I want to give people some time to write a question. And because you, sh you should have a question. What what do you have a question about the plot, about this culture, about this book, about anything relating to Anthem? So click on this link. And if you if you click on the text box and you can text it out, I think what's nice is to use um, a sticky note. You can pick your color and then uh, you can ask a question. What is the unspeakable word? So this is a great place to like, like this is a parking lot where you can drop your questions. Um, yeah, let's look at, at the question. 